Anyway, um, this afternoon's presentation is entitled 1,000 Years of Peace. And basically what we're going to do this afternoon, we're going to look at a number of the different topics that we've been looking at over the course of the last, what has it been, six or seven weeks we've been meeting together. Uh, things like the Second Coming, the State of the Dead, Hell, Heaven, a number of these topics, we're going to be, it all kind of comes together in this particular presentation that we're going to be looking at today. So um, let's dive right in and, and get into our presentation today. All right. In 1971, this man, anyone know his name? John Lennon, the musician. He wrote a song called Imagine. And that particular song encapsulated the idea of a perfect utopian society. And in that particular song, he sang the following words. He said, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. And uh, in verse 2, John Lennon goes on, and he, say, he sings the following. He says, imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. No religion to. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Living a life in peace. In essence, the lyrics encourage the listener to imagine a world at peace. And I mean, the reality is, friends, when we look around the world today, don't we? Do we see much peace going on? We don't, do we? There's not much peace. But to live in a world without barriers of borders, divisions of religion or nationality, and to consider the possibility that the focus of humanity should be living a life unattached to material possessions. This, these are some of the ideas that are expressed in this particular song. But sadly, we find that Lennon's life was cut short back in uh, de December 8, 1980. Uh, he was, uh, his idea of living life in peace was cut short when he was uh, shot five times in New York City uh, by a guy by the name of Mark David Chapman. And so universal peace, the kind that John Lennon sang about, seems to be a very elusive goal today. It seems to be very elusive. Society has grown so accustomed to evil that we struggle to even imagine such unprecedented peace. And yet, as we're going to see this afternoon, friends, the Bible speaks about such a thing. It actually says that there will come a time where there will be incredible peace, where we don't need to worry about the problems that we see in our world today. The Bible predicts that there will be a period of 1,000 years or a millennium of absolute peace. Did you know that? Anyone not know that this afternoon? We're going to unpack that today. Would you, would you like to live in a world today, friends, where you have absolute peace, no more problems and hassles and anxieties and troubles, no more death? Would you like to live in a world like that? Amen? All right. Well, just think about it. No more wars. No more terrorist attacks. No more crime. No more shootings. Um, the good news, friends, is that day is actually coming. It's actually coming. The word, the word millennium itself is not actually found in the Bible, but it's actually clearly illustrated there. Uh, John describes this period of time in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. He says this. He says, and they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? 1,000 years. 1,000 years. So the word millennium is derived from two Latin words. The word uh, milli means 1,000, and the word annus means a year. So that's where you get this 1,000-year concept. So clearly it's there, even though the word itself, millennium, is not written in the Scripture. And the word simply means 1,000 years. That's it. So here we find God's people are going to live and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Who's looking forward to that day? Anyone? Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Well, in today's uh, presentation, friends, what we're going to do is we're going to map out the events that take place before this millennial period, this 1,000-year period. We're going to see that there are six main events that take place before, excuse me, before the second coming, that there are five events that take place during the millennium, and then finally another six that take place after the millennium. So, some of the questions we're going to consider this afternoon are these. Firstly, um, we're going to look at this idea um, of the 1,000 year period. We're going to ask the question, when does it take place? When is this, are we living in this period now? Did you know there are some Christian groups out there today who believe that we're living in the millennium right now? Some people believe that. Um, some other, others teach that it's entirely symbolic. Some believe that it's taking place right now. And uh, some believe, and that's, I, I, this is the particular position I take as I read the scripture, 
that the millennium is going to take place after Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming. The millennium is going to follow that period of time. And I'll show you from the scripture why I believe, I believe that. So what then is the truth regarding the millennium? Well, the Bible makes it very clear that there are two distinct resurrections. Did you know that? There are two distinct resurrections. So uh, let's have a look at this in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. It says the following. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the what? First resurrection. What is it? First. The first resurrection. Over such as says the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him for how long? One thousand years. There's that word again in Revelation chapter 20. So by here we find the Apostle John is emphasizing um, a first resurrection that lets us know that there must be what? Second. A second. A second resurrection. Is there any proof of this in the scripture? Are we just kind of pulling this out of the hat and saying this to you this afternoon? Well, let's unpack it a little further. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. It says this. The same author of the book of Revelation, he says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. That's going to be a powerful declaration. So when Jesus comes back at the second coming, he, his voice will be heard, and it says the dead will be raised back to life. They will be resurrected. And that's what it says. Those who have done good to a resurrection of life. And then it says, and those who have done evil to a resurrection of Okay, so how many resurrections are there in that verse? Clearly, there are two. The fact that there are two separate and distinct resurrections, one for the righteous and one for the wicked, can clearly be seen in the Bible. In fact, there are a couple of other verses that mention this same idea of two resurrections as well. So we just looked at John chapter 5, 29. It speaks about a resurrection of life. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 15, it talks about the resurrection of the just. And then in Revelation 26, what we read earlier, it talks about that first resurrection. And then in all three verses, it speaks about a resurrection of condemnation, a resurrection of the unjust, and a second resurrection as well. So clearly, the Bible talks about these two resurrections. Now, at the end of time, there are only going to be two groups. Two groups. But there's going to be the saved and the unsaved. The righteous and the wicked, the pardoned and the punished, the saved and the lost. And there's going to be no middle ground. I guess at the moment you can say there are people who are in the middle that haven't made a decision for Christ or against Christ. But a time is coming where this whole world is going to polarise into two groups and you are either on the one side or the other. And friends, you and I, we want to make sure that we're a part of this group here. Amen? We want to make sure that we're a part of that first resurrection, the resurrection of life. Now, the Apostle John, he tells us that who is actually going to participate in this first resurrection. That is what he says in Revelation 20 and verse 4. It, it describes the people who are going to be a part of this first resurrection. It says the following. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ again for a thousand years. So here, John, he speaks of these three faithful dead, these martyrs, who laid down their life for Christ, who died for their faith and belief in Jesus Christ, who would ultimately live and reign with Jesus for the millennium, for that thousand years. And so clearly we see that the millennium takes place, oh sorry, that, yeah, the millennium begins with the first um, resurrection. Okay? Now the next verse goes on to tell us who will not, um, sorry, who will participate in the second resurrection and when it will occur. In verse 5 it goes on. It talks about the other group, those who ultimately will not participate in the first resurrection. It says, but the rest of the dead, it says, did not live again until the thousand years was finished. So it talks about one group who are going to participate in the first resurrection. And then it says, one thousand years later, there will be a second group who will participate in something called the second resurrection. And we're going to unpack that a little later as we go through. So... So here we're told that the rest of the dead, or the wicked, or the unsaved, are raised in this second resurrection at the close of the millennium. All right. Now, in this particular chart I have up on the screen, we're going to have a look at the character traits of those who fall into the two categories of these resurrections. Okay, let's have a look at the first. It speaks there of the first resurrection. The Bible describes those who take place in this resurrection as being blessed, as being holy. 
as being faithful martyrs, as having done good. Okay, that's a description of those who participate in this first resurrection when Jesus Christ comes back. But then it goes on to talk about this second group. It talks about the second resurrection. It says it talks about the rest of the dead. It says that they are deceived. It says they're not found in the book of life and ultimately that they have done evil. Now, friends, let me ask you the question. Which group do you want to be in? The first or the second? I think it's pretty clear, isn't it, from the scripture as we can see there. We want to be a part of that first group. Now, as I mentioned, the Bible makes it very clear that there will be two separate and distinct resurrections. Again, there's going to be the, um, the first resurrection, as you can see this, um, just there up on the screen, and there will be that second resurrection. And the 1,000 years separates those two events. And uh, we're going to have a look now at the six events that are going to lead up to the beginning of the millennium. Okay, and some of these things we've unpacked already. Rui just uh, spoke about the second coming and a number of different topics that we've already seen, but we're just going to summarize it really quickly this afternoon. Now, the millennium, it begins with that first resurrection. Okay, are we, are we clear on that? You can see that? Okay. Clearly, this is a resurrection of the righteous which occurs at the second coming. We've seen in a previous presentation, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. It says there, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. It says the dead in Christ will rise first. You see, it goes on and it says that the dead at this point will be rise. Those who had a relationship, who died before Jesus came back at the second coming, it says they will be resurrected and they will rise up and they will meet Jesus in the end. But it goes on in verse 17. It says, then we who are alive and remain, it says we shall be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, um, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So those who are faithful to Christ, and who are alive on the earth at this time, it says, will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air as well. Okay? So the saints of all ages, who are described as being holy and blessed, in that verse we looked at it, um, earlier, in Revelation 20 and verse 6, it says, they will participate in that first resurrection. You know, there's a story of a, of a grave of a lady over in Hanover in Germany. And um, she didn't believe in the resurrection. In fact, so much so that she put in her will that when she died, that they were to get two massive um, slabs of granite. They were to place them on top of her, of her grave just in case, if the resurrection was true, that there would be no way on earth that she would be able to be resurrected from, the, uh, from her grave, from her tomb. And um, in, in her, um, in her uh, uh, will, um, it, uh, it was said to be made so secure that if there was this resurrection, she would not come out, no matter what. No matter what side, first or second resurrection she would come from. And on the marker where inscribed the word, it says, the burial place, this burial place, must never be open. Anyway, in time, what happened? A little seed that was underneath that granite slab began to grow. It began to grow. And uh, as it grew, it slowly pushed its way between those two granite stones, ultimately, and it became a large trunk that inevitably ripped the two granite stones apart, and, and the steel clasps and the sockets that it was connected to, to try and keep this thing on top of this rock. And uh, that tiny seed had become a tree that pushed aside both of those stones on top of her, um, of her grain. And the dynamic life force contained in that little seed, friends, is a faint reflection, a faint reflection of the tremendous power of God's creative word that someday will call back to life all of those who died in him. I like that story, that's why I included that one in. Now, unfortunately, there's a sad side to this story as well, too. You see, the faith of those who neglect to accept Jesus Christ is also described in the Bible as well. We kind of looked at this a couple of weeks ago when I did a presentation on, on hell. We had a look at that particular topic. And uh, we saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says the following, that describing this event when Jesus Christ comes back, it says, The Lord shall consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. You see, when Jesus comes back in the clouds, when he comes back, those who have chosen to live a life apart from him, ultimately will be destroyed by his brightness and by his purity and by the purity of his coming. And you see, sin cannot abide in the presence of a holy God. 
And the two just don't mix together, unfortunately. And, and well, not unfortunately, it just doesn't, it doesn't mix. That's as simple as that. The two, the two simply cannot coexist one with another. And so at this time, it says the wicked will ultimately be destroyed and, and will receive the wages of sin, which we're told in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, being death. Ultimately, they receive their wages. And notice how the wicked are going to react when Jesus returns. It says in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 15, it says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, what did they do? It says they hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And it goes on, and it says, and it says, and they say to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So when the wicked see Jesus coming back in the clouds of glory, friends, it says they're going to wail and they're going to mourn. A deep sense of guilt will fill them with this terror, and they cry for the very rocks and the mountains to fall upon them, to hide them from the face of Jesus when he returns. And clearly, they are not going to participate in this particular resurrection, but we will have a look at them a little later. So when Jesus returns at the second coming, friends, there are only going to be four groups of people at this time. You can see it there on the screen. You're going to have the, be the, you're going to see the righteous who are living on the earth at this particular time. You're going to have the righteous who are in the grave, who will be ultimately resurrected. You'll have the wicked who are living on the earth at that time, and then you'll have the wicked who are in the grave as well. And so we see, when you look at, uh, read the book of Revelation, John describes the return of Jesus in this cataclysmic event. It's just, it's going to really um, wreak havoc upon the earth when Jesus Christ returns. In fact, let's have a look at Revelation in verse 16, verses 18, 20, and 21. It says the following. It says, there was a great earthquake. And it says, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the, on the earth. Then it says, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. It says, great hail will fall from the heaven upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. So here we've got a very descriptive um, picture as to what is going to take place upon the earth just before Jesus Christ comes back. And in fact, if you're wondering what's the weight of a talent, um, some commentaries, they say it's basically the equivalent of 30 kilos. I mean, that is one big hailstone, isn't it? It's pretty, a large piece of ice. And so we see that these events, as these events are, are just, you know, shredding the earth, um, the wicked, it's ultimately going to destroy the wicked, okay? That, they, will be, um, they will be dead at this point. Uh, they will, those who are not alive will obviously remain in the tomb at this time until after the 1,000 year period, and that they will participate in that second resurrection, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, I want you to notice how the prophet Jeremiah envisioned, he looked forward into the future, and he saw, basically, the fates of the wicked at the second coming. Notice uh, what he wrote in Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 33. He said this, he said, And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth, he speaks, even to the other end of the earth, it says, they shall not be lamented, nor gathered, nor buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. And so we see that the destruction of the earth is going to be so complete that nobody is going to mourn over the dead and there are going to be no more funerals. Why? Simply because the righteous are caught up to meet Jesus in the air and the wicked ultimately will be destroyed when Jesus returns. The dead will simply become dust and ashes upon the earth. You see, this world, which has well over six or seven million or billion people, uh, will, will become completely depopulated. It's hard to imagine, but ultimately that is what's going to happen. And Isaiah, again, God showed this man, this prophet, how this was going to happen. Notice what it says in Isaiah 24, verses 1 to 3. It says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth what? What's the next word? Empty. He makes the earth empty. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. You see, there's not going to be one single human being, friends, left remaining upon the earth after the second coming. There's a reason for that. We're going to unpack that in a moment. Now, particular churches around the world today, they teach this idea of a second chance. That when Jesus Christ comes back, that uh, some will be taken, but some will be left behind. They'll have an opportunity to get their life right with God before he comes back, okay? 
And uh, this idea of the second chance theory or the secret rapture um, is, is clearly not something that is taught in the Bible. And I think Rui unpacked that a little in, I think, the second or the third presentation that he had. But again, the Bible is very clear. When Jesus returns, the wicked or the unsaved will be destroyed and there will be no further opportunities to repent of our sin. Every person will have had every opportunity, friends, to accept that free gift of salvation before Jesus Christ returns. And that is why he is pleading. His Holy Spirit is working overtime today to make sure that people are giving their hearts, surrendering their lives to him in order that they may be ready before Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming. Um, but their case will, ultimately, talking about the wicked, their case will be closed just prior to the second coming. Notice what John says in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11. He says the following. He says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So you can see a work of judgment has taken place to decide who is fit to live with God throughout eternity and ultimately who will not participate in that. Now in the religious world today, a major difference of opinion revolves around this question. Where exactly is Jesus? Where is he right now? Where does Jesus actually spend the millennium? Is it upon the earth or is it up in heaven? Okay. Um, the Bible makes it very clear where the resurrected saints are, and it says that they are going to be with Jesus. You see, notice the following two verses. Revelation 20 and verse 4 says, And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. It's referring to God's people, his saints. They are living with Christ for this thousand year period. And then it says in Revelation 20 and verse 6, it says, They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the Bible makes it abundantly clear that you and I, um, are going to live with Christ for this 1,000 year period. But the question is, where? Are we going to be here on the earth or up in heaven? Um, where is Jesus at this time? Well, in Revelation chapter 20 itself, the verse that we're basically looking at today, we're not specifically told. Okay, The common teaching is that you will hear that uh, Jesus' millennial reign will take place upon the earth. A lot of people believe that, that ultimately God's people are going to live on the earth during this 1,000 year period. But this is only an assumption. You see, the Bible does not place Jesus and the saints either in heaven or even on the earth during the 1,000 years. So how can we be sure exactly where we're going to be? We know we're going to be with Jesus. And in one sense, it doesn't matter because as long as we're with him, that's all we need to care about, isn't it? But are there any clues to help us solve this mystery? Is there anything in the Bible that we can glean to help us understand clearly beyond a shadow of doubt where we're going to be during the millennium? Well, there are. There are. Let's have a look at it. You see, God's Word, friends, give us very definite, clear evidence supporting the view that the resurrected saints uh, will spend the millennium, millennium with Jesus in heaven and not upon the earth. Why do I say that? Well, please follow carefully this chain of evidence. John speaks about those in Revelation 20 and verse 4. He says, Who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and it says that they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So according to John, the apostle, those who didn't worship the beast or his image, nor received his mark, lived with Jesus through the land. Clear? Does that make sense so far? Okay, very clear. All right. Now, John speaks about this same group in another chapter, in Revelation chapter 15, he says the following in verse 2. He says, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over who? The beast. The beast, okay, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass. Sea of glass. <coughs> so again, here John sees this same group who have victory over the beast, his image and his mark, standing on this sea of glass. Now, John pinpoints beyond a shadow of doubt where this sea of glass is in Revelation 4, verses 1 to 6. He says this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and behold a throne set where? In heaven. And one sat on the throne. Before the throne there was a sea of glass, like crystal. You see, friends, if the saints are standing on the sea of glass, which is in heaven before the throne of God, then clearly God's people must be where? In heaven, and not upon the earth during the millennium. So 
So, breaking down what we've looked at so far, we've seen um, the events leading up to the first resurrection, or the millennium. Um, we've got the return of Jesus. We've got the righteous dead are raised when Christ comes back. We've got the living saints who are caught up. They meet Jesus in the air. We've got the, the, the wicked who are slain by the, by the brightness of his coming. Uh, we're told that the earth will be desolate at this point. It will be you know, largely devastated by all the various things, the earthquakes, the mountains falling, and the islands being fled, fled out of their place. And finally, the righteous will be in heaven with Jesus. I'm going to have a drink. All right. So far, we've looked at six remarkable events which precede the millennium. But uh, what takes place during the millennium itself? What are we going to be doing in my next presentation? You know, are we just going to be playing harps for eternity? And that's all we do. Uh, we're going to unpack that a little in the next presentation. But what else are we going to be doing in heaven for 1,000 years? Let's turn our attention now to the millennial events, first upon the earth, and then we'll have a look at what we're going to be doing in heaven. Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2, it says this. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, and when the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, he laid hold of the dragon, the servant of old, who was a devil and Satan, and it says, and bound him for 8,000 years. It goes on to verse 3. And he, that is the angel, cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be loosed a little while. Hmm, interesting. So there are two things that really stand out in these verses. Firstly, a great chain is going to come and bind Satan. And secondly, it talks about this bottomless pit, which uh, forms the prison where he will spend 1,000 years. Now, can these things be literal? Throughout the prophetic code, or throughout the scriptures, the Bible, we've acknowledged that Satan is a real being, amen? There are some churches who actually believe that Satan is not real. But Jesus himself, he said in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, he said, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. This once dazzling um, angel called Lucifer, who made himself into a devil called Satan, is clearly a supernatural being. Okay? He is from heaven, ultimately came to this earth. The simple reason tells us that no literal chain or pit or prison could secure such a supernatural being. In fact, the scripture tells us the exact same thing. Um, you may recall a, 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 one of the stories in the Bible, one of the experiences that Jesus had as he was sitting across the Sea of Galilee. Now, this is what it says here in Mark chapter 5. It gives us a bit of an insight here. It says, uh, Jesus, it says, And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gennarides, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him, um, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He was a man who was possessed by a demon or devil or demon, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And it goes on. It says that no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. Now notice, could this man be bound who had this devil inside of him? It says, and the chains had been pulled apart, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. Now ask yourself, if a devil-possessed man could easily break asunder or break into... Uh, a chain with supernatural human strength, is it likely that the prince of devils himself could be bound with one? I don't think so. You see, so what kind of chain is God, is it that God uses that is so effective upon, so that is so effective in binding Satan? Well, during the thousand year period, the millennium, that we find that the devil is chained by circumstances, okay? And it says in Revelation 20 verse three that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So we see, friends, it's a chain of circumstances which binds the devil more securely than any literal chain that could ever be forged. Notice the circumstances in which Satan finds himself at this point during the millennium, the thousand years. You see, in the first place, all the righteous have been taken away. Where are God's people during the millennium? They're up in heaven, okay? And all the wicked have been struck there by the brightness of Jesus' second coming. And thus we see that the entire earth is depopulated and there's no one left for Satan to tempt. At least for a thousand years. A little later we'll see that he will. You see, this unique situation was foreseen and depicted by the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. And that's what he said about this. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 33, he said... And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, 
or gathered or buried, they should become refuse on the ground. You see, usually when people die, they're lamented, aren't they, by survivors. You know, they usually have a, a funeral service, you, 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 you have that to, to remember the dead and so forth. And they're gathered, they, they die, they're buried out of respect as well as for sanitary reasons. But inspiration tells us that none of these things are going to take place after the second coming. Why? Simply because there are no survivors upon the earth in order to perform these rites. They are either in heaven or they themselves will be on the earth. Now, to illustrate this point, imagine, you know, for a moment, a man who's in deep trouble and he thinks of someone that he can get on the phone and call for some help, maybe a friend in a position of influence. And, but he goes to his friend and his friend replies to him on the phone. Now, he gets on the phone, he says, um, and he, he says, I need some help. And his, his friend replies to him by saying, you look, I'd like to help. I really would, but with my circumstances the way they are, my hands are tied and there is nothing that I can do. Now, are we to assume that that man is literally that his hands are tied at that very moment? Is that what that phrase means? Is it means that he's literally tied up and he, he can't get out of it in order to help his friend? No, it's just a figure of speech, isn't it, that we use. He's tied up, he's not able to assist his friend at that particular point. Of time. So sometimes the intangible circumstances can be more restricting than the literal bonds themselves. Now, in a similar way, Satan is securely bound uh, or chained, if you will, by circumstances beyond his control. And again, the prophet Isaiah, he foresaw this in his book, the book of Isaiah, chapter 24, and verse 22. King James Version says this it says, They shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. They shall be shut up in prison, and after many days they shall be visited. Okay, so it says something. There will come a time where he will be released, but at the moment there is nothing that he can do. Now what about this idea of the bottomless pit? Uh, in Revelation 20, verse 3 and 4, it says the following. And he was cast into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Now, is John describing here, maybe somewhere upon the earth, this giant chasm of a hole with literally no bottom? Is, is that what John is describing here? Is there some hole on the earth where Satan and his angels are all going to be thrown into? Well, the Bible interprets itself, and that's why we need to allow the Scripture to interpret Scripture. Not just have my, some fanciful ideas from man, we need to allow the Scripture to interpret itself. And the Greek word there for bottomless pit is the word abusos, all right? And it's where we get our English word abyss, right? that same word. Now, interesting, that same word is used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, where it says that the earth was without form and void. It's the same word, abusos, okay? The word simply means a, a dark wasteland, a state of chaos, a desolate region. So it's not a literal hole somewhere on the, on the planet, on the, on the face of the planet that the devil and his angels are thrown into, it's just talking about the state of the earth at this particular point. And again, it's amazing how the scripture speaks about these things. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah, again, he was shown these things that would take place in the future. He says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. It was an abyss, abyss of that same word. And the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And verse 26 says, All the cities, therefore, were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. Now this vision that was given to the prophet Jeremiah was in 620 BC. And what period of earth's history was he seeing when he wrote, Lo, there is no man. What period? Is it referring back to creation? Or is it referring back to the events that we're looking at during the millennium, which is still future? Um, some believe it's, it, the, the prophet is referring back to the book of Genesis, the creation of this earth. But um, there are a couple of things there in the verse that clearly make it clear beyond a shadow of doubt that it's not. Let me show you. The first of these, is it referring to the creation event or is it referring to the millennium as a future event? You see, um, I'm sorry, it can't be the creation event. Well, firstly, there was no man before God formed Adam, the first man, okay? So no man upon the earth. So yes, you could say it refers to creation. Jeremiah said that the earth was without form and void, which is also true of that time during creation. 
although these two clues fit the, the, the puzzle or the period of creation, we immediately realise that God placed a third and fourth clue in the verse that, that clearly shows that it doesn't fit. Okay, the third one, Jeremiah says the following. He says, the Lord felt um, his fierce anger and unreasonable and ungodly attitude at the beginning of the creation week. God wasn't angry. He says that after his creation, he said everything was good, didn't he? It was very good. We, we read nothing about God being angry during the creation event. And then finally, um, Jeremiah, he writes about all the cities, how they were broken down. Well, there wasn't even a city built when God created this earth. That came later on with the, with the creation of Babylon and that. So this vision couldn't possibly be the creation week. Okay, for many didn't build cities before he was created. So the only other time in human history, I think, in which Jeremiah is referring to here, where there is no man upon the face of the earth, is clearly referring to the millennial period, this 1,000-year period, when the earth is desolate and empty and there is no man. So at the second coming, God is going to reduce this wicked world back to its original state of chaos. In this state of absolute devastation, and darkness, the earth itself is going to become a bottomless pit and a bussos, where Satan and his demon cohorts will be helplessly confined during this period of 1,000 years. And this time of solitary confinement will force the devil and his angels to consider the tragic events of their sin and the devastation that they have brought upon the earth. Now let's take a look and see. That's referring to what's happening upon the earth at this point. What's taking place in heaven with God's people? What are we doing during this 1,000 year period. Judging. Judging. Hmm. Okay, Revelation 20 verse 4 tells us. It says, I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and it says, and judgment was committed to them. Now, this verse gives us an astounding insight into the kind of God that we serve. You see, it tells us something about the kind of God that we're dealing with here. <coughs> how he chooses to govern, and how he intends to bring complete resolve to the problem of evil and sin. You see, God does absolutely something remarkable here. And I want you to notice, firstly, what he does for God's people who are going to be in heaven during this 1,000 year period. He invites them, he invites the redeemed to judge his decisions, to consider his, his decisions and the judgment. Secondly, to evaluate them for themselves, the history of the great controversy between good and evil, and thirdly, to assess <coughs> sorry, all the factors that have contributed to each person's destiny. The point here, friends, is this. God is open, he's transparent, and he involves each one of us in full disclosure of how he is dealing with the problem of sin. He's not pulling the wool over our eyes, hiding stuff from us. He wants to see why he's doing or the decisions that he has made in the judgment and why he's done why that is the that is the case. He's not hiding anything from us at all. You see, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul spoke about God's involvement in the judgment process. And, um, <coughs> notice what Jesus said to his disciples in Luke chapter 22 and verse 30. Um, he said the following: He said, You may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then the Apostle Paul, he asks this question in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 and 3. He says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? See, friends, that's you and me in, during, in heaven during the millennium. We will look at the records and see why God, we will confirm the decisions that God has made in the judgment process. You see, the angels mentioned here are those fallen angels who have exercised their free choice to indulge in evil and follow Lucifer in his rebellion against God. And so during this time, the saints, they will not decide who is saved and lost. That has already been done because God has already determined every case before he's come back to give his reward to his people. You see, friends, when Jesus returned, the Bible says that the judgment will have already taken place, that it will be complete. Does that make sense? Before, you know, like for someone who's on trial, the case needs to be heard and discussed before a verdict can be made, ultimately. And it's the same with the second coming. The judgment needs to take place first, right now, to see who is fit for God's kingdom. And when he comes back at the second coming, that is when he gives the rewards. And that's why this verse here says this. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. 
Now, it's obvious that the decision regarding who gets which reward has already been made prior to Jesus coming back. Does that make sense to you? A lot of Christians don't get that. They say the judgment's after or during the millennium or after the millennium. But the judgment needs to be taking place now, completed before Jesus comes back in all sense to me. Now, looking at the judgment just quickly, there are three phases. Firstly, there is the pre-advent phase, which is described in Daniel chapter 7, which takes place from 1844 to the second coming, which is for the benefit of the good angels, the onlooking universe, seeing how God is dealing with the problem of sin. And uh, there's the millennial phase, that's the one I'm referring to here in Revelation chapter 20. Um, it, it takes place at the second coming and it finishes 1,000 years le uh, later, and it's for the benefit of you and I. And there's a reason for that, and I'll unpack that in a moment. And then thirdly, there's something called the Great White Throne Judgment as well, which is referred to in Revelation 20 verse 12, which will take place at the end of the millennium till the event ends. And it's basically for both the saved and the lost, and we'll get to that too. All right, so looking at this second phase of judgment, not the pre-advent one, but the millennial one. The second phase of judgment is for the benefit of you and me. You see, God, again, is operating on this principle of full disclosure. Uh, he opens up the record books of heavens and he shows his people three things. Firstly, the lives of the wicked. Secondly, the choices that they made. And firstly, thirdly, the reason why they are lost. And during this time, friends, all of our questions are going to be answered. All right? Imagine you now if we get to heaven and we see someone like um, Hitler walking around. Are you going to have questions in your mind if you see someone like Hitler then? You're going to have questions, aren't you? You're going to wonder, well, how on earth? What's this guy doing? He, you know, responsible for killing millions of people when he's in heaven. You see, people will see evidence demonstrating, friends, just um, de demonstrating just how much God has tried to win people over to His side. They're going to see that it, to save every person, and ultimately, you and I are going to be satisfied that God is both a true and a just judge. That He's been faithful in all His ways. In fact, John Newton, this guy. He was famous for writing that song, Amazing Grace. We, we sing that beautiful song all the time. And he commented on this very point in time, in history. And he said the following. He said, if I ever reach heaven, I expect to see, uh, find three wonders there. First, to meet some I had not thought to see there. Second, to miss some I had thought to meet there. And third, the greatest wonder of all, to find myself there. I thought he described that beautifully. You see, the idea of this millennial judgment, friends, is for our benefit in order to clarify in, my, in our minds why people we thought wouldn't be there and may turn up there are there, and those that we thought totally would be there and they're not there. It will be for our benefit. So during the millennium, God, he invites our questions. He submits himself to our scrutiny, knowing that we will find him to be just and true in all of his decisions. That's why we read in Deuteronomy 32, 4, he says, he is the rock, his work is perfect, and all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. It's a beautiful verse, isn't it? Describing the character of God. He's just perfect, isn't he? Yeah. All right. So what's taking place during the millennium? So looking at the second phase, during the millennium, you've got Satan is bound by change of circumstances, that the earth is empty at this point. There's no one on the earth at this, this period of time. It's a bottom that's described as in the bustos, being in the bottomless pit. And uh, finally, the righteous are in heaven. And uh, finally, we will assist in the judgment. Not in terms of making decisions, it will be more confirming the decisions that Christ has already made prior to his return to this earth. We're going to have an opportunity during this time to raise any questions and have those questions and it answered satisfactorily. That's what this period of the judgment is for. All right, so that's to say God's people in heaven, Satan and his angels are bound on the earth. What about the wicked? We, we spoke earlier about this second resurrection. The first one takes place at the second coming, but what about the second resurrection? What's this all about? Well, at the end of the thousand years, all the wicked from the entire history of planet Earth will raise from their graves. And again, we read this in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 20. It says, but the rest of the dead, that being the wicked, did not live again until the thousand years was finished. Friends, that is one of the saddest statements in all of the Bible. <coughs> I'm sorry, one of the saddest statements in all the Bible is found in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8, because it says, they shall be as numerous as the sand 
on the seashore. That's what it says in the scripture regarding the unsaved. You see, why is there a need for a resurrection of the wicked? I mean, they've already died. Why does God bring them back to life only to die again? These are some, uh, this is a great question I've been pondering. This is why I believe you. it's the case. Firstly, it reveals that their character hasn't changed. Even if they had another thousand years to live, they, they, they're the motives, the character, the heart. Nothing has changed. <coughs> Secondly, it exposes the character of those who seemingly lived a good life, yet never took a stand for Jesus. And thirdly, the wicked are given an opportunity to seek the outcome of their choices and ultimately to acknowledge that God was fair and just in his decisions. See, as a result, the wicked being resurrected, we also find that Satan is released from his prison at this time as well. It says in verse 7, <coughs> Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be again released from his prison. At this point, the devil will be unleashed, enabling him to once more do his treacherous work. Because these people have come back to life and resurrected, that being the wicked, he has an opportunity to deceive them once again. And so he will rally them, billions of people to unite in his final work of deception against God and his righteous saints. Now, God reveals to John on the island of the Patmos what is going to happen with God's people at this point. Because in Revelation 21 and verse 2, it says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of where? Yeah. This is another text that tells us very clearly where God's people, that they're in heaven. It says, They're coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then it says in verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So at the close of that 1,000 year period, friends, God's people have been in heaven, you and I have been in heaven for a thousand years. It says the holy city, the new Jerusalem is going to descend out of heaven. God's people will be inside of it. And it says this is the time when Jesus is going to rule from Jerusalem. But it's not the old city of Jerusalem where he's going to rule from. This is going, we're going to find he's going to rule from the new Jerusalem. But the question is, where is this particular city going to land? This, this new Jerusalem, where is it coming? It's going to land here in the strait or somewhere else? Well, we're told again in the scripture, you don't have to guess. We find the prophet Zechariah, he actually predicts the very location where the new Jerusalem is going to land. It's there in chapter 14 and verse 4 of his book. He says this, And in the days, says his feet, okay, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces east uh, Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Now you may recall that at Christ's second coming, is Jesus a speak and a touch the earth at the second coming when he comes back? No, it says that we're going to be caught up, we meet Jesus in the air. But here's Zechariah, the prophet, he predicted that it would descend from heaven onto this very mountain, the Mount of Olives. And the Lord will flatten the hill to make a great plain in order for the city to land upon. Notice again, the saints inside the city will return to this earth with God. Okay, notice again, Zechariah 14, 5 and 9. It says, Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. You're going to come from heaven in the new Jerusalem back to the earth. And it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. So on this divinely excav excavated plain or valley, the holy city will come to rest, completely covering the old side of the new Jerusalem, or the old Jerusalem, I should say. Well, the heavenly city is absolutely larger. And the measurements of the city are described in Revelation chapter 21. It says this. It says, The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city in the width of the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. And that picture there, you see on the screen, gives you a bit of an idea of the size of the new Jerusalem itself. You see, when you convert a furlong, it basically comes to 2,220 kilometres on each side. So that's the length, the breadth, as well as the height. And basically, it's forming a cube. I mean, that's how John saw it in his vision. I'm sure it's going to be something far more glorious, but they're the, they're the, that, that's how he described his vision that he was shown by God. 
And uh, the main reason I believe that John is that God is very specific in giving John the dimensions of this particular city is he wants to make it clear to everyone that there is enough room for all of us. Isn't that good news? That all there is enough room for each and every person on this planet who wants to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that's why I think we have that additional detail in the scripture. Now, what will Satan influence the wicked to do when they're raised from the dead? Well, Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8, it says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from prison, and he will go out to the sea, the nations. So that's referring to the wicked, those who are not inside the New Jerusalem. It says, uh, which are in the four corners of the earth, God and Magog, to gather them together to the battle, uh, to battle, uh, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So even after the 1,000 years, friends, the devil has still not changed. He's had 1,000 years to consider all the horrible things that he has done. But when the, the wicked are resurrected once again, his character hasn't changed. He's going around deceiving the nations, getting them ready in order to take on the city. And literally billions of people are going to join the devil in one last ditch effort to try and gain control of that glorious city. It's going to be his last stand, which ultimately will um, result in his final doom. Now, realizing that they're shut outside of the New Jerusalem, the wicked are going to organize an attack to conquer it. That's why we read in verse 9. It says, They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So here again, Satan will deceive people into believing that he was unjustly deposed from heaven and that they together can capture this city and that they can take control. So why are they so intent on getting inside? I mean, why don't they just go to the other side of the planet and carry on over there? Well, I think there's a, there's a reason that we can, we can glean from the scripture regarding this. You see, one possible reason why they're trying to get inside the city is because we're told there in Revelation 22 that there is a very important tree, a very important tree inside the city. It says this, Revelation 22, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God, and of the land, in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was a tree of life, and the leaves for the tree were for the healing of the nations. Hmm, interesting. Why is that so significant? Well, if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, you may remember there, um, God um, said to Adam and Eve, he said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat, he will what? Live for how long? Forever. His concern back in Genesis after they had committed sin is that if they have the access to the tree of life, they can carry on living as sinners for all of eternity. And this is why I think Satan and the wicked are trying to get into the city, that they can have life forevermore too. Okay? Um, yes, yeah, so it's therefore ultimately the Lord sent him out of the Garden of Eden. So man, we know from Scripture, Rui really did that presentation on the occult, we looked at the idea that man does not, and women, does not inherently possess immortality. It's a gift that we receive at the second coming of Jesus. Um, but the wicked do not have this gift. They will be resurrected for a short period of time, but they don't have the gift of immortality. And so the devil deceives the wicked into believing that if they can storm the city, get inside, in the tree of life, that they will live and not die. But whatever the reason is, friends, the Bible makes it clear that they will... That that um, in death that they've experienced no change. Nothing has changed in their heart. And they come up from the grave um, actuated by the same desire to conquer that, um, that ruled them when they fell in the first place. And some time may pass as they lay their plans and they strategize as to how they're going to ultimately take the city by force. Um, and it's going to take the city. But if you read Revelation chapter 20 and uh, very closely, the battle never actually takes place. It looks like they're, they're, they're gathering together, they're mar Satan's marshalling this big army to save the city, but ultimately, the battle never takes place. You see, Satan leads the attack, the angels unite their forces and this wicked militia. But the assault on the city of God is brought on by an abrupt halt. As God's throne um, suddenly appears in the heavens above the city, and the final phase of judgment begins that we looked at previously. See, Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and it said, Books were opened. Okay? And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things written in the books. 
You see, the books were opened, every person's life will be made to pass before he or she. Everything will be open to the wicked and for the righteous to see. Well, the righteous already know why the wicked aren't going to be there. This is one of the reasons, I think, that God is allowing the wicked to be resurrected so they can see why they ultimately are not inside the walls of the city. Ultimately, they, the wicked, are going to acknowledge that God has been fair and just in his decisions as to not allowing them to have eternal life. That's why we read in Romans 14 and verse 11. It says, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. You know, some may wonder, what's the purpose of this great white frame of judgment? It's just another part of the process, again, to vindicate God's character and his government. To show that he is being open in the decisions that he's been making. He's not hiding anything from anyone. You see, even in the end, the wicked will bow down before, before God and, not, and acknowledge that he's been faithful and true. So you notice this statement from Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. It says, and, and it says that at the name of Jesus, it says not some, just the, the, the righteous and not the wicked. It says every, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, friends, it is after this universal admission that we discover the fate of Satan and his followers. In Revelation 20, verse 13, it simply says there, regarding the wicked, that they were judged, each one according to his works, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Friends, this is the, um, the resurrection in which there is no return. Okay? Um, there's no resurrection uh, from which the wicked, once they're thrown into this fire, ultimately, as we saw in our previous presentation, they'll be consumed, they'll be turned to ashes. There's nothing left, nothing left at all. You know, that's why John uh, records in Revelation 20, verse 9, he says, The fire came down from God out of heaven, and it said, It devoured them, destroyed them completely. It'll be, the earth will be turned into a ball of fire, basically. It's going to destroy sin and sinners. Everything will be completely consumed. And this is this concept of hell that we looked at a couple of weeks ago in the scripture. It's not going to be something that burns forever and ever and ever and ever. It's just going to keep burning until there's nothing left to burn and then that is it. And um, basically this the destruction of evil is an act of justice, not, not of cruelty. This event is just as heartbreaking to God to see the death of his own son hanging on the cross. Nevertheless, he knows that it must take place ultimately because if he was to allow it to carry on, then we'll just continue to have misery and suffering and death and pain and sorrow throughout all eternity. And this is the whole point. God is wanting to eradicate that completely so there's none of that left. You see, God has done everything he can, friends, everything in order to save people in this world. He's done everything possible. He loved them. He gave his son for them, but they persisted in their rejection of his love. God, he cannot afford to allow sin to carry on in this world. That's why ultimately he has to destroy the wicked. And as we saw in that previous thing, it's something that grieves his heart. It's a painful experience for God. But in this fateful event, God, he finally executed that sentence of eternal death against the wicked. Notice again, the entire planet is going to become a molten mass. It says in Malachi 4, 1 and 3, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be, what does it say? What does it say? Stubble. So stubble. That day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. They shall be ashes. There will be absolutely nothing left. Eventually the fire will go out, completing its work, leaving only ashes. You see, this fate also includes ultimately the, the final, um, the fate of Satan himself too. It says he will be amongst all the proud that do wickedly. In Ezekiel 28, 9, 18, it says, Therefore I brought fire from your midst that devoured you, I turned you into ashes upon the earth in the sight, in the sight of all who saw you, and it says, You shall become no more. That's the ultimate fate of Lucifer there. So what happens next? Well, Revelation 21, 1 and 4, it says this. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, it says. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and God wiped away every tear from their eyes, there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crime. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. You see, after witnessing the tragedy of hellfire, Jesus is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. God will ensure that this final, this sad final sin will never be remembered again. And all traces of sin will now be gone, and God's people will have an eternity of happiness in a brand new, perfect earth. 
You looking forward to that day, friends? Yes. Amen. Praise God. You see, the paradise that Adam and Eve lost by sin will be restored to all of its full Edenic glory. Peace, joy, love, fellowship, happiness will rest upon God's people forever. That's why we read in Psalm 16, verse 11. It says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence, it's being in the presence of God, is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Beautiful verse, isn't it? So what events take place after the thousand years, friends? We've seen just briefly the unrighteous dead will be raised up. Satan will be loosed. Christ, the saints, and the city will descend from heaven. There will be that last, that great white throne judgment, the third judgment we saw. Satan's sin will be destroyed and ultimately the earth will be cleansed, renewed, and made brand new. Friends, the Bible says that Jesus is preparing a place for you and me right now. Isn't that good news? That's why we read in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Is that your desire today, friends, to accept Jesus' invitation to be where he is? Jesus invites us to enter into that city where it's safe and to spend the millennium and eternity with him. And today, Jesus is knocking on the door of our hearts. And that's why he says in Revelation 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And what happens, friends, as a result of letting Jesus come into our house, or him come into our heart? We read in Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are those who do his commands, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter the gates into the city. Isn't that good news, friends? That's incredibly good news. When we let Jesus into our homes and into our hearts, he promises that he'll let us into his kingdom. Is that your desire today, friends, to be found inside the gates of the New Jerusalem?